just this much time. Well, you got to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> and is it my eyes failing, or is it a little out of focus? Uh, yes. Your eyes are failing. My eyes are failing. <laughs> You know, when I was a, a young man, uh, well, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, um, I became aware that as people got older, they lost their eyesight. Being visually oriented, that made me very sad. But now that I'm older and it's happening, it's I realize it's really not such a bad thing because as a young guy, I would get up every morning and look in the mirror and frighten myself. <laughs> now I get better looking every day. <laughs> so I guess we're ready to rock and roll? Sure. Great. So today we'll talk about the hidden value of transit. And our quest today is to determine if we can obtain funding for transit in such a way so that sufficient funds are available to build, operate, and maintain transit facilities and services. Uh, so that development is encouraged adjacent to transit facilities rather than at remote locations. And so that all beneficiaries of transit pay their fair share. Next. So one of the key uh, things to remember from today's presentation is that how we raise money for transit is just as important as how much money we raise. And a good example for this, uh, setting the transit example aside, is water and sewer. Most of us pay a per gallon fee for water and sewer. And of course we could pay for water and sewer with sales taxes. Sales taxes raise lots of money. But the nice thing about the per gallon uh, fee is that it encourages us to conserve water. We tend not to leave the tap on because that would waste our money as well as wasting water. And when we have a leaky faucet, we just don't see water going down the drain, we see our money going down the drain. And that motivates us to fix leaky faucets. If we paid for water and sewer with a sales tax, would we conserve water? Would we fix leaky faucets? Yeah. Probably not. So there's a, there is a benefit to user fees. But uh, uh, next, so but the question is, I don't know why. Here's five behind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next, yeah. So can we recover the full cost of transit with the fare box? Well, transit is very very expensive, and uh, using uh, if we tried to recover all the uh, cost through fares. The fares would be so expensive that hardly anybody would ride. And if nobody rides transit, traffic congestion and pollution go up. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So uh, next slide. So the question is, are there other beneficiaries uh, for of, of transit? And uh, of course, everybody benefits from transit. Everybody gets better access to employment, shopping, schools, and recreation. Everybody benefits from cleaner air. And of course, uh, the reduced congestion uh, leads to lower uh, delivery costs and lower costs of goods. So everybody benefits from transit. But these general benefits are not suited to user fees because these benefits are difficult to meter. So we pay for these out of uh, general taxes, such as sales or income taxes. Next slide. So this is the traditional transit budget equation. Fares plus general taxes equal transit costs. Next slide. But in reality, especially today, we find out that fares and general taxes don't quite give us the amount of money we need. So the question is, how do we get to where we need to be? Next slide. First option, of course, would be to raise fares. But as we previously mentioned, uh, increasing fares would reduce ridership, increase traffic, increase smog, and reduce the business opportunities that arise from concentrating people around transit stops and stations. So that doesn't look like a good idea. Next slide. Another way to fund transit would be to raise general taxes, but that would reduce people's disposable income and thereby reduce business opportunities. Higher taxes tend to 
reduce people's perception of their quality of life, and it creates resentment, A, for the politicians who raise the taxes, and drivers tend to resent transit riders because they think that they're subsidizing people for a service that they're not benefiting from. So that tends not to work too well. So there's a third option. Next slide. Oh, yeah, go back one. And uh, that is, oh, you're going the wrong direction. Um, so, so the third option is to reduce service. And uh, reduce, reducing service, again, lowers ridership, increases traffic, increases smog, and reduces business opportunities. So, and as you know from the next slide, uh, the traditional approach leaves us unhappy. And so our, our, uh, our goal today is to see if there's an alternative approach that can leave us, lead us, leave us more satisfied. So, of course, there are some specific beneficiaries of transit, uh, drivers in particular. They benefit because, uh, I guess I have to ask my respondents here, is there traffic congestion in Pittsburgh? Uh, all signs point to yes. <laughs> and, it's not New York. But right. It's not New York. Right. And, and would that congestion be worse if there was no transit? Absolutely. Okay, so drivers are receiving a direct benefit from transit. And drivers, some of whom complain about their taxes subsidizing transit riders, typically pay no user fee for their use of local roads. Next slide. So distance-based congestion pricing for roads would do several things. One is it would reduce congestion. A lot of people who drive are taking non-essential trips and creating congestion at peak periods. Um, and some of the revenue could be used to help pay for the transit services that benefit the, the drivers. Pennsylvania has been charging distance-based uh, tolls on the Pennsylvania Turnpike for many, many years. And in Maryland, the intercounty connector charges drivers based on both distance and congestion. So the, the toll that they charge varies in real time as the road becomes more congested. I don't know if they do that in Pennsylvania, but if not, Pennsylvania could look to Maryland for an example of how to do that. Next slide. So here's an example of how there are invisible beneficiaries. The, the drivers are perhaps visible beneficiaries of transit, but there are less visible beneficiaries as well. And this example is from the 1800s. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the streets were unpaved. And uh, when it was dry, it was very dusty. And uh, in wet weather, the mud made travel very difficult and unpleasant. Paving streets and sidewalks was a tremendous advance that made properties more accessible and cleaned the air. So everybody was going to benefit. But some people would benefit more than others. People whose property, whose, whose property fronted a paved street or sidewalk would benefit more because no longer would people be tracking dust, mud, and manure into their homes and places of business. So their land would increase in value. And even if these property owners lived in a different city and never walked on this street or sidewalk, because they owned this property, they would get a benefit in terms of higher land values. Next slide. So in 1894, Congress, which controlled uh, affairs in the District of Columbia, rather than paying for all the, the street paving costs out of the general fund, they passed a law that required 50% of the first time paving of streets and sidewalks to be paid for by these invisible beneficiaries, the property owners. Next slide. Uh, a transit example. Was that a frontage assessment or, uh, or a land assessment? I'm not sure. I believe, I, I'm not sure. I'll have to, I would have to look into that. In the early 1890s, the Chevy Chase Land Company acquired over 1,700 acres of land uh, in the northwest section of Washington, D.C., and just over the border into nearby Maryland. This land, mostly farms and forest, was very, very cheap. And it was cheap because you couldn't get to the jobs and the stores that were in downtown Washington. <coughs> At their own expense, the Chevy Chase Land Company created a streetcar line from downtown Washington out to their land, and they charged people a few pennies to ride the streetcar. 
Uh, now, next slide. The, the few pennies that people paid to ride the streetcar probably paid for the conductor. But there's no way that this covered the cost of laying down the rails and buying the streetcars. So was this an act of charity or altruism on the part of the Chevy Chase Land Company? Absolutely not. They recouped that cost and more through higher prices of land that they were selling for home lots and business lots. This land was now more valuable because it was now cheap and easy to get from their land to the downtown where the jobs and shopping. So the thing that's important to note here is that if the Chevy Chase Land Company had tried to recoup all the streetcar costs through the fare box, the streetcar rides would have been so expensive that nobody would have ridden it. And both the streetcar project and the land development project would have failed. So the thing to remember is that when we're trying to pay for infrastructure, such as transit or roads or other things, it's important to get the right balance between your user fee and an access fee, or what I refer to as land value return. Getting that balance right allows infrastructure to succeed. Uh, next slide. So I talked about an access fee for infrastructure or land value return. What is that? Well, if public goods and services are well designed and well implemented, land that's well served by that infrastructure goes up in, in value. Now, people say, but that comes back to the public anyway through the property tax. Well, our traditional property tax typically recovers between 10 and 20 percent of the value of public works. And what that means is that 80 to 90 percent of that value ends up as a windfall to whoever is lucky or shrewd enough to own the best served land. And this windfall serves as the fuel for land speculation, a parasitic activity that really does more harm than good for most cities. If land value return was more robust, land speculation would diminish and land prices would drop. Next slide. So typically, when we think about applying a fee or a tax to something, most people assume automatically that the price will go up. But uh, that's because most things that we apply a tax or fee to are things that are produced and the tax or fee becomes a cost of production. Land is not produced, and applying a fee to land does not shrink its supply. Land prices themselves reflect the benefits that people expect to receive from owning it. And if we apply a fee, such as land value return, we reduce that benefit and thereby lower the price. So, again, I, I start off by saying that it really matters how we collect money as much as how much money we raise. And to explain this in the, in the transit context, I thought it might be useful to compare and contrast a development impact fee with land value return. So let's take a look at the next slide. So here we have a situation where we have a new transit station, we'll call that M, and it's next to two lots. Uh, this lot has a building on it, this lot is vacant. And the community will want to raise $1,000 from which to pay for the transit service. Now, some people will look at this situation and say, well, the person who owns this building here, they're getting all the benefit from the transit, right? Because the customers, employees, and business owners who occupy this building, they're the ones who are getting the benefit from the transit, they're using the transit, and the fact that that transit service is available means the rents that the building owner gets are going up. So the best way to fund transit would be to tax that building based on its size or value. That would be the fair thing. And of course, the owner of this vacant lot, they're not there, nobody else is there, they're not getting any benefit from transit. So next slide, please. So they put this development impact fee on the building, and this development fee is uh, a tax on building value. It's a cost of production because, as we just said, if the building wasn't there, no fee would be owned, owed. So anytime we increase the cost of production, the quantity of stuff that gets produced goes down and the price of what's left over goes up. So the question I would ask is, do we want to reduce development near transit and increase its price? I don't think so. But taxes or fees on building values have that impact. 
and they appropriate privately created value. And this burdens developers, future owners, and the tenants of those buildings. So land value return is a different approach. It's basically a fee based on infrastructure access. As we mentioned before, land is not produced, and so uh, the price of land is not based on cost, and, and the fee will not increase the price of land. So next slide. So we see that the land value fee, or land value return, increases not the cost of production, <coughs> but the cost of ownership. Increasing the cost of ownership means the benefits of ownership are lower, and that lowers the price of land. So a land value fee does not diminish the quantity of land, it returns publicly created value to the public, and does not put any burden on the private sector. And as we can see from this slide, you can see down at the bottom, under the development impact fee, the owner of the vacant lot pays nothing, and the owner of the building pays $1,000, because we said that's what the community needed, was $1,000. This owner is punished, essentially, for creating and maintaining value in that building. And if the owner of the vacant lot wanted to put up a building, they'd not have to only cover the cost of the new building, but cover the cost of the impact fee as well. So it's a, dis a disincentive to development. On the other hand, the land value return approach both lots are getting the same benefit from this transit. They've both gone up in value the same amount. Therefore, both lots pay the same, which means that the owner of the developed lot isn't penalized for having a building. And the owner of the vacant lot is not penalized if they want to put up a building. On the other hand, owning that vacant lot now becomes a lot more expensive. And if you're paying money out and getting nothing in return, that's not a good situation. So this actually becomes an incentive to develop that lot. Next slide. So we're talking about how landowners respond to taxes and fees. We all know that most times taxpayers try to avoid a tax or fee if at all possible. And if there's a fee on the building, the development impact fee, we could avoid that by reducing the number, size, or quality of new buildings that we build. If we have an existing building, we could reduce our maintenance, and that would make the value of the building, and therefore the fee go down. And if we really wanted to build new buildings, we could do it somewhere else, in a lower tax jurisdiction, rather than here where they have the development impact fee. Well, how do people avoid the land value return fee? That's not so easy. Unlike the building, whose value is controlled by the owner, the value of the land is not controlled by the owner. The value of land is controlled by what the community does around a piece of land to make it a valuable place to live or do business. So there's nothing that the property owner can do to reduce their, the value of their land, so it's very hard for them to avoid the fee. And I don't know if anybody's tried this, but it's very difficult to move a piece of land from a high tax to a low tax jurisdiction. <laughs> the logistics are just horrible. There's so many dump trucks involved, and at the end of the day, you really haven't accomplished much. So, the land, tax, the land return fee cannot be avoided. So, what's the option? The option is to develop the piece of land to get income from which to pay the fee, or sell to somebody who will. Right, well, yeah. thank you, Paula. Good point. So, next slide, please. So, we've seen from what we just discussed that landowners receive substantial benefits from infrastructure, especially transit. And if we use a land value uh, return, landowners return value in proportion to the benefits received. And the greatest impetus for development will occur where land values are high. And typically, that's adjacent to urban infrastructure amenities like transit. And indeed, that's where we want development to occur. So instead of chasing development away, which is what the development impact fee would do, a land value return fee will actually draw development toward the infrastructure. Next slide. This is just sort of a schematic diagram. Uh, I think Bill Batt was talking about stocks and flows. Uh, this shows the public here. They pay taxes on labor and capital to the government. The government uses those taxes to create public goods and services, and many of those public goods and services inflate the price of land. 
Now, a little bit of that value trickles back to the government through the traditional property tax. But the lion's share ends up going to people who own land, particularly that small percentage of landowners who own prime sites. And the thing that's perhaps most interesting about this diagram, which is a picture of the status quo, is that if a taxpayer wants to take advantage of the infrastructure that they've created through their taxes, they have to pay twice. First, they pay in their taxes. But if they really want to take advantage of that infrastructure, they want to have their home or their business next to the highway interchange, next to the transit stop. They go to the landlord, and the landlord, you know, if they say, here's my first month's rent, and they hold up a fistful of dollars, the landlord will smile and say, well, that'll rent you any place else in town, but here, you're next to the interchange or the transit station, the rent, you know, you've got to pay a premium rent to locate here. So you end up paying a rent premium to locate near the infrastructure that you've already paid for with your taxes. Needless to say, paying twice for infrastructure is not uh, something that endears people uh, to the status quo. Next slide. So land value return and recycling would create a situation like this, where the land value created by infrastructure gets returned to the public that created it and recycled to maintain and operate the infrastructure that created that value in the first place. And the wonderful thing about this is not only does infrastructure become financially self-sustaining, at least to a greater extent than it is today, but as a result, taxes on labor and capital can be reduced. And because land values are being returned to the public, the, the impact of public infrastructure on land prices is less which means when taxpayers try to access the infrastructure that they've already paid for in taxes, their rent premium is lower than it was before. If you could toggle back to the previous slide, just again to highlight the difference, you see how the rent is higher here. And next slide, if we make land value return more robust, rent goes down as well as taxes. OK, next slide. So now that we've seen it does make a difference how we raise money for transit, the question is, how much of the transit bill can we pay through land value return? Can we get all our costs? So this is an example from the Washington, D.C. area. Across the river, just south of National Airport, was a railroad yard in the 1990s. It was called Potomac Yards. It was owned by a pension fund. The railroad yard wasn't used for railroad purposes anymore. It was several hundred acres. And they thought we could, the pension fund thought, well, we can develop this land and make money for the people who, who have the pensions that we manage. But they were denied a permit. And uh, the, the permit people said, well, we can't allow development of this land because the only access is Route 1. And Route 1 is full of traffic at rush hour. It would be very irresponsible for us, the permit officers, to load more traffic onto the street. But we can't help but notice that the yellow and blue metro rail uh, transit lines run right through the middle of the property. If only there was a transit station here, we'd reconsider. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, the landowner did the math and found out it was cost effective to pay for the entire cost of building a new metro rail transit station at this location. Next slide. And here's the article from the American Public Transit Association uh, newsletter in 1995 extolling the fact that, wow, golly gee whiz, here's a private landowner who's willing to pay for public infrastructure. Of course, the people who lived on the other side of Route 1 saw the pictures of the transit-oriented development that was being proposed. Now, keep in mind that this is right next to an airport. We're not talking skyscrapers here. Probably the tallest building was going to be four or five stories. But it, compared to the empty land that was there before, it looked very dense. And the homeowners on the other side of Route 1 were concerned about all the traffic it would generate. So next slide. They, they, they pleaded with their politicians to downzone Potomac Yards. And the politicians, being the good people they are, they did what their constituents wanted. They downzoned the site. So it was no longer cost effective for the pension fund to pay for the metro rail station. So they did matter of right development. Next slide. And... Uh, you know, people talk about smart growth. This is dumb growth. So matter of right development led to big box retail, targets, Old Navy, that sort of stuff. 
So, you know, a few cinder block buildings surrounded by acres and acres of parking generated a lot more traffic than the transit-oriented development ever would have generated. But it was a matter of right development, so they went ahead with it. Next slide, please. So if that downzoning had not occurred, we would have had a private landowner pay for the entire cost of a new metro rail transit stop. How neat is that? But the question would be asked, well, is this a unique circumstance or could this be replicated? Well, the, the thing that made Potomac Yards unique is you had a single landowner who could internalize most of the benefits associated with the transit stop. Typically, you have many people who own land around public infrastructure. Now, the key thing to remember here is that multiple landowners don't negate the fact that infrastructure is creating a lot of value. It just makes it a little harder to collect, but that's what governments are set up to do. So, uh, in conclusion, all beneficiaries should pay for their fair share of transit. Users should pay a fare, drivers should pay for congestion reduction, and the landowners should pay for the benefits they receive by having access to productive infrastructure. And of course, everybody should pay for cleaner air and lower cost of goods. Next slide. So, no, uh, one back. So landowners might never drive on a road or ride a transit vehicle, but they use this infrastructure to extract windfall profits. They're the invisible beneficiaries of transportation facilities and services. Land value return and recycling assure that landowners pay in proportion to the benefits they receive. And transit created land value is thus returned to, to the transit authority and helps sustain it. And next slide. And so here's our new transit budget equation, land value return and recycling plus congestion reduction fees plus traditional user fees and general taxes should lead to satisfying our transit budget needs. And uh, next slide, please. So using land value return and recycling helps make transit economically viable because it's an often overlooked and underutilized revenue source. Uh, the land use consequences that we mentioned are very favorable. It, land value return reduces land prices and, redu and induces more development near transit. And if those revenues are used to reduce taxes on buildings, then development near transit can be even more affordable. It's also equitable and comprehensible because the land owners are paying for a benefit they receive in proportion to the benefit received. Next slide. So that concludes my remarks, and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers about what they think. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I can just chime in a bit. Hold the mic close if you can. Can we hear me? Yes. Is it on? Hold the mic. It's on. It'll record. You can leave it on the table. Just get it fairly okay. close. Cool. Close to your mouth. All right. Is this good? Yeah. Good yes. Man. Perfect. Uh, my name is Daniel Blonsky, and I work at a uh, transit advocacy organization here in Pittsburgh called Pittsburghers for Public Transit. Um, just let me survey the room. Who's Has anyone heard of Pittsburghers for Public Transit and the work that we do? Great. So at Pittsburghers for Public Transit, uh, we are a, a, a grassroots union of transit riders and transit operators that are fighting for a expanded, more equitable public transit service in, in Pittsburgh. Um, the organization got started in 2010, 2012, around an enormous transit funding crisis in Pennsylvania. Um, the uh, state funding for transit was, was about to run out, and uh, PPT mobilized with the Amalgamated Transit Union, uh, with with the with, with communities, with the business com uh, interests, uh, because everyone again benefits from transit. So there was an enormous push uh, at the state level to pass uh, a transit bill, which fortunately uh, was one. Is Act eighty nine? Is that bill that was passed? Uh, it was was an enormous win for transit because. Uh, 
you know, we, we don't have any sort of stable funding in Pennsylvania that transit agencies can rely on. So now transit agencies have 10 years of assurance. That was great. Uh, but right now we're looking at, at the, at 2022 is going to be the end of, of when that transit funding, uh, is available. Um, although it gives the transit agencies, uh, certainty and it gives them support, uh, it, it, it pulls its money from the Turnpike uh, Commission, and I don't know, another show of hands, has anyone followed this Turnpike debacle, transit funding debacle? The Turnpike is massively in debt, billions and billions and billions of dollars in debt, and they have done a, a great job of, of, uh, of, of pulling more bonds uh, to, to expand highways, while also you know, digging themselves in debt, saying that, that, that this current arrangement funding transit is is unsustainable which i mean yes it is um and we talk about uh the uh anger that turnpike payers uh feel towards transit riders i think a lot of in the media we're hearing you know people complaining about how unsustainable this is and why are tra turnpike drivers uh subsidizing transit and it got to the point where uh, earlier i think it was last year uh, the Truckers Association brought a lawsuit against the Turnpike Commission to say, you know, we truckers should not be paying for public transit. Um, that went through the courts. Fortunately, uh, it was decided just a few months ago that that uh, suit could not go forward and that, you know, for better or worse, the current um, arrangement for transit would have to stay. Um, so here we are, you know. Uh, transit advocates, transit agencies, um, businesses, communities are relying, are, are still in the same position we were, uh, looking at a clip that is coming in 2022. Um, uh, so uh, I think the, you know, that brings the, that brings us back to, to Pittsburghers for Public Transit and the work that we do. Um, and because at PBT we uh, fundamentally, um, a, a fundamental um, cornerstone of, of our organization and our beliefs is that uh, all of this work has to start grassroots in the communities uh, because those are the folks that know the solutions that to the issues that they're facing. Um, so I think we, we can look just to, to PPT's different campaigns. Um, last year, there was a expansion of the East... Uh, or, uh, a bus rapid transit line between downtown and Oakland. Uh, this, you know, hypothetically, uh, is, a, is a great thing. We should have uh, great transit connecting our two largest job centers in the city. Um, but that proposal was put forward with 50% uh, service cuts to the Mon mm -hmm. Valley, which are some of our most transit dependent communities in the region, um, in Allegheny County, in the entire transit system. Um, so, you know, PPT working from the grassroots was able to mobilize with thousands of residents through the Mon Valley, held a, you know, rallies, series of escalating actions um, for over a year. And then uh, last spring, it was announced that, you know, the BRT would go forward without the service cuts, um, which is a, an enormous win for that community. Um, but we don't want to, as an organization, you know, we start in the grassroots, but we don't want to always be on the defensive. So having that, those sort of proactive campaigns, PBT worked with uh, those folks in the Mon Valley to lay out a series of campaigns. The Rider's Vision for Public Transit is what we're calling it. Uh, it calls for an extension of the East Busway. It calls for uh, equitable, fair policy changes so that, uh, you know, we can have free transfers. We can have policy called fair capping um, that allows... Uh, poor riders to pay uh, similar prices to rich riders because currently the, the just the bus pass to buy a monthly bus pass is 90 bucks 100 bucks at the beginning of the month if you don't have that in your your bank account you're not going to be able to afford it so you have to you know you have to pay on the per ride and by the end of the month you paid more than a rider who has that 100 bucks in their account and can afford the monthly pass at the beginning of the month um, so these grassroots campaigns are the work that we're doing now. Um, again, looking at this uh, transit funding cliff, 
And uh, as, as John Robeson, who is in the back of the room, will tell you, uh, there is really no one who is taking the lead on how we avoid this enormous cliff, and this is including you know, state reps all the way up to the top. Um, so an idea for reform is going to have to come from the grassroots. Um, I think that the framework that Rick laid out uh, in terms of a land recycling, um, a restructuring of how we do our, our, um, our taxes, our property taxes and our land taxes, um, you know, is, is perfectly feasible. Um, and I think it's something that PPT would support because we see the value that transit brings to, uh, to land and we see East Liberty where uh, this is a transit, this is a community that's built around public transit um, and we see what the current uh, system uh, uh, that does benefit landowners is doing for renters in East Liberty and we're seeing rents rise, we're seeing people being displaced to the Mon Valley, there are places without access to transit and that's just... That's not a sustainable system. Um, so yes, we do need to fix, uh, you know, what what we've got <laughs> working currently. Um, again, uh, working with the grassroots, I think the importance is how do we take these these very big, very high level ideas and uh, and and work to make them to more understandable, but also to to organize in community and. And he, you know, listen to what people are saying, and uh, and follow their lead on how we can go forward. Um, so I think I think that you know we we can perhaps get more information in a Q and A sort of setting. Uh, but again, Pittsburgh is for public transit um, because we are we do work with with grassroots communities and uh, labor. Um, we have Tom Conroy, who's joining us as well. Um, so I'll introduce Tom. He is a retired operator. Uh, used to work with the Port Authority for how many years? 19. Um, sorry, these mics are off. No, it's on. Oh, it's on. Okay, so 19 years Tom spent uh, driving for the Port Authority. Tom can talk a bit about how he got involved in Pittsburghers for Public Transit, you know, why he was an operator and why he gets activated with the grassroots um, advocacy as well. Good morning. Good morning. I became a bus driver in 2001. I was 47 years old. I'm a barber by trade. I was 47 years old and I realized I didn't have much of a pension. And um, so I kind of reassessed my what my marketable skills were. And I had two. The, stuck out in my mind and one was I liked to drive and I was pretty good with people through years of 20 years of being a barber I could talk to people I could handle people so I applied and got this job at Port Authority and um, great union job good benefits good pay took you five years to get to the top rate and when I hit top rate I, well, I found out that I really did enjoy driving the bus. The physical act of driving the bus was fun to me, as crazy as that may sound. <laughs> um, so there I was, I was there five years, and we were notified that there were massive cuts coming. They were pretty much on track to cut 25% of the service in this county. And um, the next thing I know, I was being ushered into a room where they were explaining to us how to file for unemployment and how to get these kind of benefits when you no longer have this job. And that was kind of a huge kick in the butt to me. And um, so I got more involved with Local 85, which is the union here. And we had rallies, we had protests. Um, I wound up barely surviving the cuts. They didn't go as deep as they said they were going to. But we had wage freezes, lost seniority, but still, I had my job. A lot of people didn't. So... <clears throat> I get, I get more involved with the union to fight all this kind of stuff and to, to join the fight for funding transit, 
many trips to Harrisburg, many rallies, hoarse voices from screaming. Um, and then along comes PPT, Pittsburghers for Public Transit. And when I took a look at this group, and they were just forming, it was very raw, very small, I thought, this is a brilliant concept. They're uniting workers with passengers and the interested public, whether or not they use transit or not, to fight to keep this. And it seemed to be a perfect marriage to me, so I got involved. Um, the international president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, a man named Larry Hanley, who uh, recently died unexpectedly a few months ago, he was a big believer in education and joining forces with the public to keep transit strong and healthy. So PPT was born. There were other cities that started taking off. PPT, by the way, is a model for a lot of these places all across the country, for a lot of these groups all across the country. They're strong, and uh, we have a really good team of people on there. They're, like Dan was saying, now, instead of just being defensive, they're out front with things that happen. Because I can tell you, as I was a board member of the union, and we, we could talk to the management of Port Authority and say, hey, look, we're the guys on the streets. We're the guys in the trenches. Listen to us. Listen to what we tell you. But there's, there's that line, management, union. Well, these guys... I should say we guys, get the attention of the CEO because she looks out her window of the building and there's 60 or 70 people out there walking around with signs and bullhorns and chanting and singing. And they're not just union people. They're people with disabilities. They're people that use the bus every day. There's people that may not ever use the bus but still think it's a good idea to have good, strong mass transit. So uh, this is a perfect marriage to me. I'm proud to be involved with uh, both groups. I'm still involved with the union, and I'm still heavily involved with PPT as much as I can be. So that's the story. For people who have questions, yeah, um, who's got the who's got the uh, portable mic? So, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand, and the 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 mic the mic purveyors will find you, and you can ask. I wanted to give John a chance to speak. He um, he's active with PPT and and with Georgia stuff, so I thought he would be a good person to start off at the. Uh, at the speaking level, and he, I see he's taking copious notes. Hello? <laughs> yes. Yeah. John, Jonathan Rovis and John. Was that on? Was that on? I think he turned it off. Oh, you turned it off. It's it's still on. on. Probably. No, it's on. Yeah, just hold it close. Okay. I'm a charter member of the Allegheny County Transit was the official citizen advisory body created by Marilyn Skolnick of uh, Legal Limited Voters and mandated by the legislature that she managed to get through on two transit crises at the go. Um, and we're, we try to do the job that PPT is doing better than we ever did. And I speak as a past president of the Allegheny County Transit Council. And we're working with them and trying to do the same thing, and they're doing it better. Uh, and I can, one beyond saying amen to what the previous speakers have said, especially about the transit legislation. We need new transit legislation. And I hate to say this, it's up to us to write it and work with some legislators. Because 
I have checked the leadership isn't leading. I like Rick Fitzgerald. He's smart, but he's got other priorities. Uh, the Rich Fitzgerald is our county executive. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the state, but I, the, the, it just, nobody's starting. Nobody is writing the legislation. I talked to Melissa Gertie, who is Pat's new uh, director of inter, uh, inter government. Gov under governmental thank you relations, who should be the point person on working on this. And she strongly agreed that yes, we need new legislation. Yes, we need to fund transit. Um, I asked about the uh, the legislation and what was being done to replace Act 89, and she was polite and friendly and diplomatically and at length said no comment. <laughs> uh, so it's it's up to us to to work with some friendly legislators uh, and either or something. To just Allegheny County, or better yet, something statewide, on and using the land tax and from the benefit of transportation would be the ideal way to do that. I don't have to elaborate on that here, uh, but we ought to write it and write in a decent assessment system for assessing land because. The, the county screwed up the assessment of land <coughs> so badly that it wound up costing us our separate <coughs> land, uh, assessment last time. Um, <coughs> the, the, the county land assessment is a mixture of incompetence, indifference, and corruption. <coughs> uh, so we really ought to work on legislation that ought to include a simple one-page discussion of just how to assess land, which as Ted Gorky said, is easy, or it should be. And we need to start, <coughs> we need to get together some people from um, ACTC and PPT and the union, and yes, with the Port Authority, because they're our allies, talk to Melissa <coughs> Especially Ted Gorky about the assessing of land uh, today. Thank you. Rick, uh, my question concerns the range of impact on land value beyond the corridor or the station, as the case may be. Now, yesterday when Tom Gearing and Rich Nyman gave their presentations, the graphics, the maps that they used showed that the, the, the uh, value of the land was roughly just the, the uh, width of the building, uh, and, and, and it was pretty narrow. Now, I've normally thought of uh, the, the range of walking distance beyond the station usually about a quarter of a mile. Right. And a study that I did of value capture going on the north way, that is Interstate 87 going from Albany up to Montreal, the first 11 miles from Albany up to the Erie Canal uh, found that we could have raised 11 times the amount of money necessary to build that superhighway. So I used two miles on either side of the, uh, the, the, uh, the interstate as the impact area. So 
if we talk about a station walking distance of two mile, a two uh, a quarter of a mile, or a, a, a an impact for driving maybe of two miles, uh, I've seen some Parsons Brinkerhoff studies using various figures. What have you used for the impact of stations and corridors when you look at the value of the land change? Well, that's a good question. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think that makes it up. I, I turned it off before. How, does, how do I Yeah, just that way? button that's on top slides towards you. There we go. Thanks, Bill. Um, the answer is it depends. Um, some people assume, incorrectly, that transit always creates value, and it doesn't. So, for example, we could go out into an Iowa cornfield and build a wonderful subway there, and we would destroy the land value there because that land is well suited to growing corn, and putting a subway system in the middle of an isolated Iowa cornfield wouldn't induce any development there. Nobody wants to be there. So we just simply destroy land value by putting a subway under that cornfield. So you have to put the infrastructure in the right place. That's the first thing. And then the question is, well, how much value does that infrastructure create? Again, the answer is it depends on what's happening around it and how we finance it. Do we finance it in a way that induces development near the, near the infrastructure or far away? If you look at, at studies that show the land values near infrastructure, basically they tend to peak immediately adjacent, and then they tail off. Yeah. That's... Now, some people create what are called special assessment districts. They'll draw an arbitrary ring around a highway interchange or a roadway corridor or a transit station, and they'll say, well, everything on the inside of this boundary gets a benefit. And everything on the outside doesn't. And, for example, I didn't use this example in the slide, but in Washington, D.C., we had a, a situation similar to Potomac Yards. So I don't know how many people here are familiar with Washington, D.C., but the Red Line subway, which is one of the busiest subway lines in our system, going north from Union Station, the next station as part of the original system was Rhode Island Avenue, which was two miles north. That's a fairly long distance. But the reason there was no station in between was the area in between during the 60s had been railroad yards, so there was nothing there. But during the 1980s, developers wanted to put some office buildings there because downtown was booming, beginning to boom again. And just like in the Potomac Yard situation, they were denied building permits because uh, the streets around those, uh, that land was all congested at rush hour. So in 1997, the landowners came to the District Department of Transportation and asked for a, a new metro stop to be built in between Rhode Island Avenue and Union Station in the vicinity, yeah, just a mile north of Union Station. And I happened to be in on that meeting, and I said, well... The district is broke. We'd love to have a metro station there, but we're broke. We don't have any money. And if you, we know from prior experience that if we did build a metro station at this location, the value of your land would go way up in value. So if you want a metro station, you've got to help pay for it. And the landowners looked very unhappy, <laughs> and that ended the meeting. <clears throat> and the transit director and I went back to our office, and he said, gee, Rick, I'm surprised they didn't beat you up. I said, me too. <laughs> Four months went by, we heard nothing. Heard nothing. And then, out of the blue, there was a press release from the mayor's office that landowners in this area had offered $25 million to build a new metro station. <laughs> now, if they had come to me with that proposal, I would have thought, well, if they're offering 25, it's yeah. probably worth more than that. <laughs> But, you know, they went to the mayor's people, who were unprepared, and were surprised that private landowners would offer private money for public infrastructure. So they accepted the deal. And here's where it gets interesting. So we decided to create a special assessment district around the, the area of the new station. And we, we asked uh, real estate brokers and experts to help us establish those boundaries. 
and based on their knowledge, they selected a radius of about uh, about a half mile around the station. But again, because we had stations a mile to the south and a mile to the north, we have to be careful not to overlap those areas. So, so we used people with local real estate expertise to establish those boundaries. The fact of the matter is it's still an arbitrary boundary. You know, there's value created on the other side of that boundary, but mm -hmm. for the sake of administration, it was ignored. One of the things that gets interesting here also is that once we had that special assessment district created, the landowners came back to the city council. And they said, you know, once the station's completed, our assessments are going to go up, and our regular property tax is going to go up. We're going to end up paying twice for the station. We should get a credit you know, for what we're paying on the special assessment. That should be a credit against our regular property tax. And they, they, they made this pitch to the guy from the, uh, to the deputy mayor's office of business and economic development. And he thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. And I went up to him and I said, it makes no sense at all. I said, if we allow this to happen, then the landowners are simply giving us an advance on taxes they would have paid anyway, but there's no value capture occurring. He said, well, I don't know. So I, I pleaded with him until finally he said, well, we'll hire an economist to do a study. Okay. And the bottom line was the economist did a study and determined that the landowners were going to make 12 times. <laughs> 12 times what they were paying for the state. <laughs> um, in, in, in value return from the, from the new metro station. So that we didn't have to worry about them paying twice. And we were able to squash that. But, you know, I'd say in most places that wouldn't have happened. And people would say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And they would have gotten the credit. And there would have been no value. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? You didn't know how much they paid the mayor. Right, right, right. It's not a bribe. It's a development impact fee. Right. I never thought of that. <laughs> Did, did the benefit district caper? No, it had a hard edge. <laughs> okay. So um, who, who's got the right, mic right here? Back in the back. I wanted to ask uh, what you suggest for a place, say like Pittsburgh, which does not have a strong history with transit, as like you were talking about DC examples, to prove out the value, the land value around transit, because it's very difficult to establish the. A, a, a special assessment district. In Portland, right. yes, they did get one that largely funded the Portland streetcar, but they'd already gotten free money for light rail, and people knew that it was a good thing and it made things more valuable. Otherwise, it takes a visionary single landowner, like in Seattle, the South Lake Union Transit, Paul Allen, he owns a lot of land, and he says, yeah, that'd be good. But otherwise, in my town, automobile-oriented, when they wanted to put in bus rapid transit, which is even harder to prove, Boy, the landowners, they didn't even want the disruption. They weren't even being asked to pay for it. They just said, I've got a business, everything's stable, and you want to shut down the street for that. There's not a lot of sympathy. It's hard to prove that land value. As a shopping center, how many cars per hour drive by? But how do you prove the land value actually, of transit? You know, that's a good question. The question was, how do you prove land value of transit? Uh, you know, I'll let... Dan and Tom talk about the Pittsburgh case. I do think that people appreciate transit on Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh does have a very strong transit system, and they're, even though they don't have a lot of, I mean, they have some rail, but they have these busways, which act like rail. And one of the things that people often say is, boy, it's really hard to determine land value because, you know, most, build, most properties have both land and building, and how do you know how much is which? Well, the fact of the matter is, that most people understand this intuitively and they make this decision every day. If you're a suburban person and you're looking to buy a house, there are a limited number of household styles. You've got your single level, your split level, you know, three bedrooms, two bedrooms, whatever, so many square feet. There's a limited number. You know what you want. And you'll find that same house in different neighborhoods selling for different prices. Why is that? Well, one one house is in a good school district. The other house is next to, underneath the flight path to the airport, has terrible noise. 
The other house is near uh, transit, has great access to the jobs and shopping and culture of the region. So people, when they shop for housing, they understand that different neighborhoods have different prices based on the amenities they offer. That's land value. And so even though sometimes even assessors will say, oh, this is impossible to do, real people do it every day. You put a, a, a mobile home out of a factory on a quarter acre or lot in different neighborhoods, it's going to sell for a different price. People understand that. And that's what we're talking about. There are people, certainly uh, assessors and, and real estate agents, who understand the value of land. Developers understand the value of land. So I'll just leave it at that. I think it can be known, but I'll, I'll let other people talk about the Pittsburgh context and, and how it could be championed. Yeah, if I could, just two minutes on uh, on Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh's attempt to uh, center transit-oriented development is uh, this uh, transit reinvestment uh, district, uh, a TRID. Uh, is this a concept that folks are uh, familiar is, with? Is it like a TIF, a tax increment financing? I, I, I am not an economist, <laughs> and generally... Uh, well, let, uh, let me run this by you and see please, if it works. Please. So the transit reinvestment or, or improvement district, transit yeah. improvement district. The idea is that they benchmark how much tax revenue is gained from this area. They draw, again, they make a special assessment district area. They put a ring around the transit stop. Yeah. They say before we establish the transit service, this is how much revenue is being produced from a, one or more taxes. And they say now we're going to put in new infrastructure, in mm -hmm. this case transit. And if the revenues go up above the base or benchmark level, that additional revenue, instead of going into the general fund, goes into a dedicated fund that helps pay for the infrastructure. Is that what we're talking that's, about? That's exactly what we're talking about. So, and so right ahead. I think what, what we see is we, we can look to East Liberty for the effect of, of what this is. Uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania went through, I mean, I think the, the trade is somehow different from the TIF. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. But uh, in Pennsylvania, I think 2009, 2010, 2011, somewhere in that, uh, that range, went through the process of approving this, this TRID uh, financing option. And in the entire state of Pennsylvania, the only place where this, a, an, an actual TRID has been established is in East Liberty. Uh, there are dozens of, of sites across the state where lots of studies have been done. Uh, a, a uh, urban designer friend of mine says that the actual benefit of the trade legislation is that there's a lot of studies being done. <laughs> really, really no no places except East Liberty where one has actually been established. Um, I, th I think the, the 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 place where Pittsburgh is for public transit is most concerned is that in a system that allows property owners to pay their taxes out front. Uh, to then have that money invested in infrastructure, which benefits their property, doesn't bring any benefit to the people who are in that community. And through the rise in rents, as the land becomes more valuable, results in displacement of those people. So having some sort of system that allows for that, the, the taxes, the infrastructure investment to come back to the people that are in the community that don't have the privilege of owning property in that community um, is what we need to and, move towards. And I think you make a good point. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about language here because I think language can be very confusing. We spoke yesterday about how people oftentimes refer to land speculators as real estate investors. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the term investment is a good thing. So don't we want people to invest? And so language can be very confusing. I talk about land value return because I think when we talk about land value return and recycling, the concept of return seems to be equitable, right? The public sector is creating the value. We're not stealing or, or extorting value from anybody. We're simply getting back the value we created in the first place. A lot of academics use the term value capture to talk about this concept that we've talked about this morning. I don't use that term for a couple reasons. 
One is capture sounds very hostile. <laughs> um, in fact, the United Nations, Aunt Alana Hartzog isn't here with us today, but she's done a lot of work with the United Nations and other similar groups. They don't use the term value capture because they thought it sounded hostile. Um, but tax increment financing is kind of a hoax, and that's what these TRID districts that you're talking about are. Really? So, again, as I mentioned, we benchmark the, the tax revenue for an area before we make an infrastructure investment. And then the assumption is that but for new infrastructure investment, that revenue would always be constant. Well, that's a hoax. That's a myth. And the tax rate in this area is the same with or without the district, okay? So the only difference is that instead of all the revenue going to the general fund, some of that money gets squirreled away and used to fund that infrastructure that benefits those properties. So think of it this way. If the city budget said, well, we're going to set aside X million dollars to pay for new infrastructure that's only going to benefit a few people, the taxpayers would scream about that. They'd say, that's a terrible idea. Why should all of us pay for something that's just going to benefit a few landowners? So they don't do that. Instead, they create this TIF district, and they create this myth that but for the new infrastructure, revenue in this area would be flat. Mm -hmm. And any increment in <coughs> revenue, even though the rate doesn't change, any increase in revenue from new development or inflation or what have you is solely because of the new infrastructure. Even and if it's also going up everywhere else. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it creates the illusion that the infrastructure is paying for itself. But what you're really doing is you're robbing the general fund. And although a lot of people talk about TRIDs or TIFs as value capture, I say it's not. What it is, it's revenue segregation. Okay? So you're just segregating revenue. You're not capturing any new value that wasn't already being captured. And so a lot of what we have to do, and I think you put your, you know, put, put, put this well, is that we need to talk, I mean, Ultimately, this has to come from the grassroots. But unless we help the grassroots understand the situation, a lot of which has been hidden from view or, 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 or distorted or, or, or lied about, so we need to use education to help people understand what's going on. I think once people understand what's going on, then they can incorporate good ideas into public policy. Mm -hmm. But we have to dispel a lot of myths that have been created, mm -hmm. and uh, and we have to educate people about what's going on. Still time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. On the tax increment financing, mm -hmm. the, the time for this session has ended. However, <laughs> my, yeah. the next session is my session, and I'm going to <laughs> give up like half an hour of my session to let this continue because I think you guys are more interesting than I am. <laughs> 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 uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, just just clear, clarify the geography for me. Um, I did take a ride on the East Busway yesterday. Uh, is the, the Mon Valley area? Is that is the East Busway sort of centered on that? Is it at the edge? The Mon Valley is beyond the Busway. Yeah. yeah and, oh, and, really? And just just I'm sure you noticed, but as you ride the East Busway out, the nicest station in the East Busway is this East Liberty Station, which is in right. the center of this TRID district, which is just had, uh, like immediately adjacent, an enormous 300 plus uh, unit development, zero affordability, you know, all market rate, 500 parking spaces next to a transit stop. Uh, you ride sure. then for another 10 minutes, you get to the end of the line, uh, that is the beginning of the Mon Valley. So every community oh, oh, oh. beyond that is 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 it does oh. not have access to that. Oh, busway. I see. Okay, that, that wasn't clear to me. All right. Thank so you. So people have to take a local bus that stops Seems every other yeah. block to get to the busway okay. if they live in the Mon Valley. Exactly. And, yes. and Rick, um, I'm 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 a little uh, I'm a little unclear about your concept of development yeah, impact. Here. Okay, I'm, I'm a little unclear about your concept of development impact fees. 
it, it actually sounded like the two WMATA examples you gave at Potomac Yards and then the, the later development that did get the station, that sure sounded like what you were talking about in development impact fees. Well, the development impact fee is a fee placed on the value of the building. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Potomac Yards was all empty land. So the developer was going to pay for the infrastructure, for the new metro station. But, but is a development impact fee a one-time cost or an ongoing cost? Development impact fee typically is a one-time fee for a development permit. And it's based on the presumed cost of new infrastructure required to service new development. Right. And uh, so both at Potomac Yards and at the, uh, it's called, the, it was initially called the New York Avenue Metro, now it's called the NOMA, north of Massachusetts Avenue, NOMA Metro Station. The area around that was all vacant land. So even th though this was a special assessment district and assessments value both land and buildings, as a practical matter, there were no buildings to assess in the NOMA special assessment area. Okay, so they, they just came up with a relatively arbitrary number, and the only infrastructure they were proposing to pay for was the transit stop. So, Not so what they did was they looked at all the assessed value in this trans in the special assessment area. Yeah. They, they, again, the landowners were offering twenty five million dollars. So basically, the city took out a twenty five million dollar bond, and then the question was, how much do these property owners have to pay on an annual basis to pay off the debt service on this twenty five million dollar bond? And that's that was what they paid in special assessment. All right, and the special assessment sunsets once the, the bond, bond is once paid the off. Bond is paid off. All right, so there's only a minor difference between the two concepts. I mean, this is over a period of years, whereas the development impact fee might be just a one-time lump sum payment up front. They're equivalent because if if it doesn't matter whether you pay twenty-five million dollars up front or whether you finance it over twenty years, it's essentially the same. Thanks. Different ways of doing the same thing. Who has the mic? Yeah. Oh, so my next, so my question uh, is, do you know if there's any other cities that have uh, implemented some kind of model similar to the one that you're doing to fund their transportation system, and what the amount of success it's had in actually uh, being a, a fairly good model? Well, the most robust example of using land value to fund transit is Hong Kong. Oh, sure. Now, most people think of Hong Kong as the motherland of capitalism. Of course, and I'm, I'm, we're talking about Hong Kong before, while well, it was a British protectorate, before it was transferred to China. But even during those days, all the land in Hong Kong was owned by Hong Kong. So you see a lot of huge buildings, skyscrapers in downtown Hong Kong. They're owned by private developers. But the owners of those buildings pay rent to Hong Kong. <coughs> so as Hong Kong improves infrastructure and they renegotiate their land leases, that increase in land value comes back to Hong Kong. When Hong Kong decided to build transit, they created a transit authority. And they sold land to the transit authority above and immediately adjacent to the proposed transit stops. Hong Kong Transit Authority, in addition to collecting fares, also collects rent on the land around and above its stations. And Hong Kong Transit Authority is one of the few, if not the only, transit authorities in the world that r runs at a profit. Now certainly Hong Kong is a very compact and dense place, very efficient for transit. But they're not making all that money through the fare box. A lot of the money they make is through because developers are, are paying rent on the land that they occupy above and adjacent to the stations. And that's ongoing income for the transit authority. So that's that's the most robust example of, of land value being used for transit. It's very successful. How are they paying rent? Well, they, they have a people who want to put up a building on land in Hong Kong, they take out a lease. It might be a 50 or 99 year lease. And then 
if if the land value goes up when that lease is renegotiated, then again Hong Kong or the Transit Authority gets that increase in value when the lease is renegotiated. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is for Rick. Um, Considering the complexity of determining, I know you think it's easy, but I've heard so many, <laughs> <laughs> so many different uh, opinions here about two miles, or, or it varies, and and the the complexity of value capture, and the fact that if you assess too high, you actually will ruin all the incentive for developing near a transit station. Don't you think that the ultimate solution for value capture? is a market-based solution rather than an assessor-based solution? Well, they should be the same. Uh, the assess I mean, the assessment should reflect market value. And the assessment should show the market value of both the building and the land separately. Um, again, people will say, oh, it can't be done, but that's just a lie. And, uh, you know, Ted Gortney in the back of the room, he's our assessing expert. But he will tell you that, you know, nowadays, I mean, this was true in the past, but it's easier now because we now have multiple regression analysis programs that run on computer that can easily take, you know, a lot of land sales or even land and building combined sales and through multiple regression analysis tell you what component of the property adds what amount of value. So this can be done. There are people who will say otherwise, but they're just not telling you the truth. But that's not really market. That's a market is a bid-based system where you say this is the amount of rent I'm willing to pay. Well, when people look at comparable sales, that's a lot of what the assessor should be looking at. And if if what people buy and sell property is not a market indicator, I don't know what is. So who's next? Tom, do you have the mic? I do. Yes, so here we are. I'd like to raise a, uh, a technical question, and it's a problem, actually. Our uh, chapter of Common Ground in Oregon, Washington, is now, in addition to the study we've done on LVT, involved in attempting to get the um, city to use value capture financing for transit-oriented development in the new southwest corridor that is now being planned for a rail line. We have succeeded in working with the uh, Bureau of Planning. We have staff there that is supporting this idea. We have the ideas kind of captured in, a, in, in what we call transit benefit district. Uh -huh. Quarter, quarter mile radius around certain stations, not every station is right for TOD. Right. But we are now trying to put this in, 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 into a framework, a legal framework, which would be similar to an LID, Local Improvement District. However, it would not capture building value. Mm -hmm. It would capture only land value. We're having a Mm. The, we, we, we wrote uh, basically the language for the um, the, la the language for the, the benef transit benefit district but there's a missing piece and that is how do you allocate the benefit on an annual basis for each individual property in the benefit district, and there could be four or five hundred properties within this district, but they have to be allocated to individual property owners. Now, you can calculate the overall benefit be just from uh, assessments. Yeah, that has a, that'll give you a total. But when you have you have to break it down into individual properties, how do you do that? Well, a, each property gets an individual assessment, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, but you so, cannot use. So here's here's all right. Here's, here's, let me say here's, this here's, here's the deal. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Let's say, to use the example I had of of the New York Avenue Metro in D.C., we had this special assessment district created. The debt service on the $25 million bond was, let's say, $100. Yeah. 
We knew what the assessed value of land was within that district. We divide that, and then we knew that for every one dollar of assessed value, X dollars was owed for, for, for the debt service. And that was simply applied to each property. One property had five units of land value, another had seven, another had eight. But you multiplied each unit of land value by the amount, and that, that was... So, so within your district, if you have a total assessment, each property has a percentage of that total assessment. That's how you... I think it's the yeah. math is pretty simple, but I'm yeah, missing well, something. Well, it's not as simple as, as as that because I understand that basis, and that would be the logical way to do it. <laughs> but the problem is assessments are not that accurate. Well, let's 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 think about this. Let's say that we have a house on a piece of land, and let's say that the house is worth um, $120,000 and the land is worth eighty. dollars The total is worth $200,000. We're using Portland, so add a zero. Do, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, you know, let, trying to I keep mean. it simple. <laughs> trying to keep it simple. So let's say the assessor says that there's um, $100 in the bit land and $100 in the building. It's not an accurate assessment, right? But if we went to uh, uh, we reformed that system so that we reduced the rate on building and increased the rate on land. You know, it would be maybe suboptimal because the assessments weren't accurate, but as long as they're equally inaccurate for everybody, it would still be fair, <laughs> yeah, right? True. Right? That's, that's the key thing. And the other thing is, if, let's say, the homeowner now adds a second floor to the house and improves the building, as long as the assessor adds that new value to the building and not to the land, yeah. then the system will work. So even if this, somebody thinks that assessments have to be accurate to the penny for this system to work, that is not true. They have to be fair. If they're equally inaccurate for everybody, <laughs> then, well, this is, this is the difference. See, there are two ways of judging assessments. There's accuracy and uniformity. Uniformity is, is everybody being taxed on the same basis? And that's the, what your lawsuits are based on. Not accuracy, but uniformity. Right, yeah. I think so from a legal basis, as long as you have uniformity, you're in good shape. I think you're right. I, uh, we are working with uh, the, the Depart Department of uh, Urban and Regional Planning at uh, Portland State University with a professor there who is very good at this. I think we should be able to come out with a formula, and hopefully this will go forward. And uh, it's a choice now between using value capture, which we are promoting, and with the Department of Plan with with the Bureau of Planning, and TIF, which right. has been used in Portland excessively. Yeah, it's this. It we need to have support to get this. Well, let, TBD me, let me know if working. I can help. Yeah. Okay. Talking about well, it. That question of assessing land values, uh, the noble Ted Moore um, said they could boil it down to one page basic procedure for assessing land and the benefits of transit, um, which is one page is about what we can right. ask That's people to read. Right, uh, I think that can be done. And that can be included in the legislation that we need to draft and get through the legislature to replace Act 89 when it dies. Because for some reason, the people don't trust the county to do the land assessments right. just because they screwed it up ridiculously the last time. Well, you know, you raised a good point, John, and this is a question uh, for you, Dan. Um, I, obviously, uh, Pittsburghers for Transit is, is a great organization. Do you have counterparts in Harrisburg and Philadelphia? Uh, the, the answer is that there really is not a statewide um, Not a statewide, but in each city, a local transit advocacy group. 
Um, or maybe you haven't looked into it. No, I, 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 the answer is uh, unfortunately no. There are folks that uh, advocate for transit, but we see them come a lot more from the business sector than from the grassroots community sector. In places like Philadelphia? And in, yes. Okay. So, but it would be good if, if, if one could find transit advocacy, advocacy groups, whether they're grassroots or not, sure. in each of these cities, and then you could take advantage of the education you've done, share that, and then have some impact on <coughs> Act 89, which of course is a statewide law, and just you know, just because the Pittsburghers are are mobilized and educated doesn't mean mm -hmm. they're going to uh, win the day in Harrisburg. Right. So, having creating an alliance of transit advocacy groups around the state might be a way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Uh, Rick and and all of you and other transit activists face one uniform problem, which is sort of the, the NIMBY problem, <laughs> which is, look, uh, you have people who are opposed to public transit, often sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes because they don't want other people coming into their, their nice neighborhoods and making changes, but it, it's sort of a uniform, how do you face the, the, the opponents, for instance, of uh, the Potomac Yards? Uh, is, are there good ways of presenting the issue so that it can make sense and win over the people like that? Right. And this is, a, this is a uniform problem faced by all activists there, of this sort. There are both structural and procedural ways of overcoming NIMBYism. One of the structural problems is when we have people who are elected by ward as opposed to being elected at large. So if you have ward representatives, the NIMBYs get more power. Because even though they may just sway the votes of one council member, none of the other council members want to contradict what that person does based on what's good for their district, based on the NIMBYs. Because if I mess with what's going on in his district, he'll mess with what's going on in mine. So as a result, the NIMBYs have undue influence there. If everybody's elected at large, then the NIMBYs can come to the council member and complain, and the council member can say, gee, you know, I hear what you're saying, I'm very sympathetic, mm -hmm. but I've got to think about the whole area, and, and so it dilutes their power a little bit. Um, that's not our experience in Pittsburgh. Well, that could, that could be. Um, the other thing that's, that's true, in the case of Potomac Yards, where the NIMBYs quashed that development, that's all changed now. Now, it's, it's 25 or 30 years later, and that was a long period of wasted time. But people were fed up with the dumb growth that took place. People realized that transit-oriented development was the way to go. And they're now creating a special assessment district to put in a transit stop. And they're going to tear down the big boxes and put up yeah. TOD. But wow. it's 30 years TOD. later than it otherwise would have had to be. TOD. What? You said TOD. Transit-oriented development, I'm sorry. And, and if I may, a, a transit-oriented development here in East Liberty that is at risk of NIMBYism and uh, the defeat of that project because of the shady side residents that are very opposed to more housing going in. Uh, the Shakespeare Giant Eagle, is anyone familiar with that site near the East Busway stop? Uh, the developer there wants to do, you know, dense housing, wants to have affordability, is willing I mean, there's still too much car parking, but but still, this is this is a, a, a good example of a transit-oriented development that you know NIMBYism, unfortunately, is is threatening the project. So folks that do see the value of transit, that do think that this is how we should we be building, you know, I'd love to connect with you, and hopefully you can help uh, combat the NIMBYs. And and I think an, another good uh, case study for where NIMBYism was defeated was Arlington County, uh, the uh, the Boston corridor on the Orange Line uh, has a lot of, in fact, if you look at satellite or airplane pictures of this corridor, you can tell where the metro stations are because you can see the dense development on top of each uh, subway station. So there are places that have overcome it. In part, they did it because they were elected at large, as I said. The other thing was that the planning office had patience. 
So a lot of planning offices are just desperate for any development. And if somebody comes in with a proposal, they just say yes. But in Arlington, on top of the metro stations, they created uh, a, a zoning envelope. And if somebody came and said, I want to put up a, a, a one-level drugstore, the uh, planning office said, well, thanks, but no thanks. Come back when you can fill up the zoning envelope. They had, they had the courage to be patient. And as a result, they got good, intense development. And one way of overcoming the nimbyism there was, obviously, there were home. This was this area along Wilson Boulevard before the subway came. It was strip malls, auto dealerships. It was very sort of low-density developments, a few single-family homes full of traffic at rush hour, very congested. The development in that area is now 10 times more than what it was. Traffic on Wilson Boulevard is the same or less than it was before, even though the densities have gone up way up. In terms of the NIMBYs, of course, the homeowners who lived right around the, the subway stops complained about their neighborhood being changed. But, of course, they were going to make a lot of money by selling out. And what, we, what the folks in Arlington said was, look, if we leave this area unzoned or zoned the way it is now, because of this new subway, there's going to be development pressure, and it's going to happen higgledy-piggledy all throughout, and it'll ruin the neighborhood. If we focus that development right on top of the metro station, we can still preserve most of the single-family neighborhood mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. in a way that we couldn't if we didn't focus that development where it belongs. In other words, it would just sort of go higgledy-piggledy. So there are ways of combating NIMBYism and, and, and creating, uh, again, the problem we have now by allowing landowners to get these windfalls from publicly created landowners, we create a situation in which no good deed goes unpunished, right? We say we want to create transit to help people get places to improve development. We put the, the station and land prices go way up, and all of a sudden, nobody, all the people we thought would benefit can't afford to live there anymore. So we really need to, to use uh, uh, land value return and recycling to make sure that development happens where it belongs and so that it can be affordable. We, uh, the, is this on? Or yes. 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 Can hear I'm, I'm here. Here. Can hear. Um, if you look at an Allegheny County transit map, there's almost no public transit to the North Hills. And I think a big reason for that, and the locals would really know more about this, um, I think a big reason for that is most of the North Hills was developed after World War II. A good bit of it was developed after Vietnam. It tends to be richer suburban, single-family houses, large lots, and very middle-class people. And I know like the Ross Park Mall is on North Hills. They didn't want transit to their mall because they didn't want poor people coming to their ritzy mall. A lot of the people in the North Hills don't want, if you can't afford to drive a car, we don't want you as a neighbor. It's, it's not the density issue, it's the quality of, of the people issue. And, um, and it strikes me that in even though I don't like that attitude, it strikes me that there's some rational sense to that, that the poor neighborhoods that were developed prior to World War II, before the automobile was dominant, those neighborhoods should get the biggest increase in land value from transit because the people who live in those neighborhoods would use transit. And so there seems to be you know, when I step back from feeling self-righteous about the North Hills people and, and <laughs> start thinking about the logical stuff, it seems that we should be putting lots of transit in poor neighborhoods, not based on compassion for the poor, which is, I think is what PPT is focused on, but based on the pure economics, that you will raise land values more in in poor, high-density neighborhoods than you will raise land values in the North Hills. And, and as you, you point out yourself, it's, it's, if you have a low-density suburban neighborhood, transit basically requires a lot of people going the same direction at the same time. And if you have low-density, single-family neighborhoods, you don't have the 
the economy of scale. The transit just doesn't work in those types of uh, land uses. There was streetcar service in the North Hills until 1968. Uh -huh. a, a brand new bridge that was put in over the Allegheny, I forget which bridge, was replaced without streetcar tracks. And uh, that's what killed off... Transit there. Yeah, yeah in, in fact, uh, Phil, uh, Pittsburgh area had streetcars in all three directions. Okay. So while we've only got the one part left, we have a we have a line of people, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we're running out of time. Quick question: um, I'm co I come from a city where uh, public transport is handled at the state level. So um, uh, municipalities, their attitude is don't look a gift horse in the mouth, and municipalities have very little participation and no participation and no skin in the game of uh, public transport. And uh, I would like to know what. Uh, what the relationship between local government and the public transport is in, for example, Pittsburgh. Uh, my city is about the same size as P Pittsburgh. And whether it's been positive or it's not been positive. Tell them where you're from. Uh, I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Congratulations to Puerto Rico. You want to talk a bit about how the county port authority here and the relationships with, with all the 90 municipalities in the, in the county? It's complicated, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Um, all these little fiefdoms that make up the county, and um, then there's the battles in Harrisburg. Uh, Harrisburg's the state. Hey, yeah, Harrisburg is our capital. I'm sorry, I'm still thinking you guys are all from Pittsburgh. Or maybe you're just from the North Hills, I don't know. <laughs> what he said was true, though. Um, so, what was your question? It was... How do municipalities and state governments relate to each other? Yeah, how do, the, how do the municipalities participate in the decision-making, in the decision-making and... and and whether it's been positive or not. Okay. Well, we have a county council, and they work with the board of Port Authority sometimes. I don't know. That's a very tough question. And, and I would just say that in the United States, I think this applies equally to Puerto Rico, federal money for transportation is given on certain conditions. Yeah. So in order for federal transit or highway money to flow to a, a state or local government, the Metropolitan Planning Organization has to have a, pl a transportation plan and that plan requires a certain amount of pub federally mandated public participation. So I would imagine that would be true in Puerto Rico as well as in you know, the continental United States. The way it works its way through will be unique to your own circumstance. But you, there should be some sort of metropolitan planning organization in San Juan that has to put together what's called a constrained long-range plan, a CLRP, and a transportation improvement plan, which is a six-year capital improvement program. And there, there is federally mandated public participation as part of that. You just need to research how that's facilitated in your area. We'll do Dave and then uh, Brendan and then, and then we'll be done. Take a coffee break. I'd like to first of all uh, thank Rick for the presentation. I think it's an important. It doesn't seem to be working, is it? You just stand up. I'm probably loud enough, isn't I? No, no, you got to speak for the recording. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. I would like to thank. I'd like to thank for the presentation and also our two guests for taking time out and come and meet us. Land value taxes. My question is really going to be to you. Um, because uh, I want to know if you've ever considered land value tax itself. Uh, what Rick is talking about is, I see, a transitional, transitional stage from where we are now to getting to full land value tax. 
it's not the ideal end product. But we do what we have to do to get the money that we need for transit. I've been a bus conductor, I've been a shop steward, and I've been uh, vice chair of transport for London and chair of London buses with 8,000 buses. But uh, to build a railway, uh, the government wouldn't allow us to have a land value tax. Um, a £16 billion 32 mile underground railway through the centre of London. And uh, so we went for a supplementary rate on the existing business tax because that was the best we could do. And that's raising a quarter, in fact, slightly more, £4.2 towards the cost. And Tories have supported that in London uh, as well as socialists like myself. But when we built the Docklands Light Railway, um, back in the 1980s, we uh, couldn't get any land value capture whatsoever. Uh, and I was really disappointed because I was advocating it. Uh, and the other thing I was advocating was that uh, we should name it, um, instead of Docklands Light Railway, <coughs> Fast and Rapid Transit. And I don't know, but for some reason oh. they wouldn't accept <laughs> the initials on the sides of the train. <laughs> but uh, my question is, have you two guys from Pittsburgh actually considered land value tax not just being a solution to transit, which we're discussing today, but as a solution to funding your, your government? Uh, I, I'm not saying no. I think that there is an acknowledgement at Pittsburgh's public transit that, that there's obviously a system that's broken and that we need to, to solve that system. I don't think that we've looked specifically, I mean, no, we haven't looked specifically into land value capture. Um, perhaps you will. Uh, yes, perhaps, perhaps we will. will. Now that we know uh, Rick and you guys are here as resources. You almost had it. <laughs> right. That's what I understand. Um, yes. Um, um, I must thank the panel, um, uh, Dan, Tom and Rick for an excellent presentation. It's really good. I'm from Ottawa, Canada, and we're, uh, a new transit line is, is about to open. And I, I won't ask the question, but I'll talk to you in, in, in the vi visually, because um, it's being funded by the government, the, lo the local, the provincial, and the, the, the federal. But they're 600 meters, so 500 yards either side, they've got a development permit. And, and it seems to be the only people that seem to be able to put um, buildings there are large developers because they, they can have the lawyers and the accountants and everything else. And I've talked to friends and they said all over the city, the medium size and small time the developer is being, being squeezed out. So I would like to have a follow up with, with, with all of you. Um, but um, so, so, and if you want to see Rick in a movie, and he's done two movies, we got on our site when you were in Washington a few years ago. Um, it was in the winter, but you were at the transit oh, station. Right. You were at the and he talked, talked, talked talk uh, about this. So, so thank you very much. And I think what is important is when we do surveys of Georgist, one of the big things they want is to outreach to politicians, policy makers, and, and the public, and I think what you guys is, 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 are doing is just excellent. Thank you. That's pretty much it, so uh, I'd like to close just by thanking Tom. I mean, one of the things, I'm, I come from Washington, D.C., and when people ask about tough jobs, they often think about cabinet-level people or the President of the United States. I think being a bus driver is one of the toughest jobs <laughs> in the city. I mean, when you think about it, you've got to you've got to uh, keep to a schedule. You've got to collect fares. You've got to be a tour guide, and you've got the safety of everybody on and around your bus in your hands. It's a very tough job, and I appreciate what Tom and Thank his colleagues do. Thank you very much. Do. It's tremendous service to all of us. We used to always say, if it wasn't for the passengers and the traffic, it'd be a perfect job.
So um, there's coffee break right across the hall, and if you want to talk to.